ever feel like the battlefield's playing field, it just keeps uh, expanding. Mm -hmm. It's not just boots on the ground anymore. It's mm -hmm. about information dominance. Land, sea, air, space, cyber, you name it. Across all domains. We're diving into ADP 313 today. Yeah. Think of it as your field guide to, you know, gaining that upper hand in the information age. Mm. It's about making sure you, the modern warfighter, mm. can leverage information just as effectively as, as any weapon system. And we're not just talking about you know, active combat, right? right? ADP 313, it lays out these strategic contexts, right? Competition, crisis, armed conflict. Mm -hmm. I'll admit, um, I used to think information advantage, it was mostly a wartime thing. Yeah, it's easy to think that way. Yeah. But consider this, imagine two nations, right? Each with, uh, you know, pretty similar military capabilities. But one, they consistently, you know, they demonstrate their ability to share information seamlessly with allies. They're anticipating threats. They're countering disinformation. The other one, not so much. Mm. Who do you think has the edge, even if even if a shot is never fired? The one who's already winning the information game, right? hundred percent. So even before a crisis even bubbles up, it's about shaping the narrative, getting ahead of it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Take, um, for example, a recent combined arms exercise. Okay. On the surface, just a display of firepower coordination. Right. But when... look deeper. That exercise, it sent a message to both adversaries and allies, right? Yeah. About our capabilities, our resolve. Mm. It also allowed us to test our information networks in an environment that's pretty realistic, that's enable at work. Okay, so that's one of the five information activities from ADP 313. Yes. Enable, making sure our own information flows smoothly, it's internal. Exactly. But what happens when that flow, it gets disrupted. We've got to protect our systems, our data, especially during a crisis. Remember that cyber attack? The one on the logistic systems a few years back? Yeah. Imagine if that happened during a major mobilization. Oh, man. Um, chaos. Talk about a wrench in the gears. That's why it, protect it, it can't just be an afterthought. It's got to be baked in from the start. It's like fortifying your command yeah, post. Yeah, Yeah, you don't wait for the enemy to start lobbing mortars before you dig those trenches. Right, right. Got to be prepared. And speaking of shaping narratives, that's where inform comes in. This is where it gets a little uh, a little tricky, I think. Yeah. Getting everyone on the same page, countering misinformation, you know, rumors. Mm -hmm. it, it, it feels like a massive PR campaign. It's more than just messaging, though. Remember that peacekeeping operation a while back? Where all those all those rumors about our troops, it just it spread like wildfire on social media. Yeah. That directly impacted how successful that mission was. Inform is about proactively building trust, making sure people understand what we're doing, why we're doing it, and addressing concerns before they spiral out of control, especially during a crisis. So it's not just about putting out fires. It's about it's about preventing them in the first place. Exactly. Okay, on to influence. Yeah. Now we're talking about shaping adversary behavior, getting in their heads a bit. In a way, yeah, but not about manipulation. Okay. It's about understanding their information environment, right? Right. Using that knowledge strategically. Let's say we know, just, just for example, that an adversary, they rely heavily on a very specific type of communication network. Okay, so we could disrupt it, mm -hmm. intercept their comms. Or we could subtly feed them some misleading information, cause them to make a mistake. Oh, wow. That's influence at its most effective, shaping the situation without even firing a shot. Okay, that's some next level chess right there. Mm. And then, of course, there's attack. And I'm guessing this one is the most, I don't know, straightforward of them all. It certainly sounds that way, yeah. But even attack requires some nuance in the information age, right? Okay. It's not just about launching cyber attacks just, uh, you know, willy-nilly. Right. We need to consider those second and third order effects. Right. Because taking down an enemy command system, that might seem like a win in the moment. But what if it what if it cripples civilian infrastructure as well? What about that collateral damage? Exactly. You have to think about that broader information environment and the consequences, the potential consequences of our actions. It's like that old saying, right? Information is power. But with a modern twist. Okay, I'm listening. With great information power comes great responsibility. Okay, I see what you did there. You know what else really struck me about this? section of ADP 313. What's that? That quote about destroying command, not personnel. It really drives home how timeless this idea, this concept of information advantage, how timeless it really is. It's from JFC Fuller, actually. Oh, okay. And what's fascinating is just how relevant that is almost a century later. Wow. 
Today, disrupting an enemy's command and control their ability to communicate to make decisions, mm -hmm. it's just as devastating as just taking out their tanks, you know, or artillery. Oh, because in this world of networked warfare, uh, a paralyzed enemy, they can't exploit any advantages. Nope. Even if they still have the physical means to fight, if they can't communicate, they're done. Precisely. Wow. And that brings us to the information advantage framework as outlined in ADP 313. Okay. The five fingers of a hand, if you will. Right. Each finger playing a crucial role in achieving information dominance. So we've got enable, making sure our own house is in order, protect, locking down our digital fortress, inform, building trust, shaping the narrative, influence, subtly nudging the adversary into making mistakes, and then attack, ah. using cyber and electronic warfare to disrupt their ability to operate effectively in the information domain. And remember, in modern warfare, sometimes those those most important victories, yeah. they're silent. They're yeah. invisible. Okay, so we've laid out these five information activities. Enable, protect, inform, influence, attack. It's like like having this toolbox, right? Uh -huh. Full of all the, the specialized gear. Yeah. But how do we actually use them on the modern battlefield? I mean, how does this actually work? That's where the war fighting functions come in, right? Mm-hmm. Think of them as all the uh, the different ways that we can apply force. Okay. Or in this case, information to achieve our objectives. So it's not just like the intel geeks or the cyber warriors who need to care about this stuff. It's right. everyone from the infantry squad to the, the logistics convoy. Everyone's going to be in the loop. Exactly. Let's take um, movement and maneuver, for instance. Okay. It seems pretty straightforward on the surface, right? Right. Troops, vehicles... They're on the move. Mm. But think back to uh, to Operation Desert Storm. Yeah. The feints, the flanking maneuvers that the coalition forces used. Yeah. That wasn't just about gaining physical ground, right? Right. They created information chaos. Yeah. The Iraqi forces. Yeah. Completely disoriented, demoralized. They were expecting what, like a frontal assault? Exactly. They got the information equivalent of a head fake? They were caught completely off guard. And they were really... And that's movement and maneuver being used to create an information advantage. Whoa. And it's not just about these big, large-scale operations either, right? Okay. A squad leader, they're choosing a patrol route, trying to avoid enemy observation posts. Right. A tank platoon using the terrain to mask their movements. Those are micro examples of the same principle, mm -hmm. just on a smaller scale. So every soldier, really, they have the potential to impact this information environment just by how they move on a battlefield. Absolutely. That's that's pretty powerful when you think about it. It is. Okay, let's talk fires. <laughs> now, this one, this one seems, I don't know, kind of self-explanatory, right? Yeah. You got artillery, you got rockets, you rain down destruction on the enemy. Mm -hmm. But how does how does the information piece fit in? That's what I'm curious about. So, yeah, obviously there's the whole blowing stuff up part of it. Right, of course. But fires can also be used for uh, for incredibly precise information targeting. Okay. Think about disrupting an enemy command post, right? Mm -hmm. Taking out communication hubs, even just disabling air defense systems with very, very carefully placed strikes. You're not just degrading their physical capabilities at that point. You're you're crippling their ability to make sense of the battlefield, to even talk to each other. Exactly. It's about knowing which targets will have the biggest impact on their information flow, not just their physical presence. Got it. Remember those strikes on, uh, on the Syrian chemical weapons facilities a few years ago? Yeah, yeah. The ones that targeted the labs, the production centers. Not just the stockpiles. Exactly. Have, yeah. Those strikes... That wasn't just about getting rid of the chemical weapons themselves. It was about sending a message, about disrupting their entire ability to wage chemical warfare in the future. Wow. That's fires being used for maximum information effect. So it's less of a sledgehammer and more of a, I don't know, a surgeon's scalpel almost? There you go. Very precise, very targeted. Mm -hmm. You're using fires to surgically remove their ability to wage information warfare. That's a good way to put it. Okay. And then, of course, there's intelligence. And in the digital age, it's not just about intercepting radio chatter, right? right. Or decoding, you know, secret messages. It's much more than that now. So are we talking about, like, knowing what the enemy's thinking before they even think it? In a sense, yes. Understanding how they process information, right? Yeah. What are their biases, their assumptions? Where are they vulnerable? Okay. That allows us to anticipate their moves. We can predict their reactions 
and we could even start to shape the information that they're receiving in the first place. So we're, we're essentially playing chess, but we're always a few moves ahead. Exactly. Let's say that we know that an adversary, they rely primarily on, um, I don't know, social media for their intelligence gathering. Okay. We can use that, right? Right. We feed them disinformation. We send them down the wrong path. Okay. Now, those are some serious mind games you're talking about. It highlights how crucial it is to protect our own information, though. Right. Because if we're sloppy... If our cybersecurity isn't up to par, if we're not practicing good OPSCC, yeah, we're giving them the keys to the kingdom. Game over. Essentially, yeah. Because without good intelligence and and a really strong protection posture, I mean, we're we're essentially flying blind in this information battle space. We become reactive, yeah. vulnerable. We can't leverage those other activities effectively. It all falls apart. Basically, yeah. Okay, that makes sense. So we've got let's see, movement and maneuver fires, intelligence, all these pieces working together to shape the the information environment. But what about those other functions, the ones we don't always think about, like sustainment and protection? How do they fit into this whole information-centric battlefield? You know, we always hear about the importance of logistics, you know, keeping the troops supplied and everything. Yeah. But how does sustainment, something we traditionally think of as a behind-the-lines activity, mm -hmm. How does that impact this this whole information advantage game? I'm having trouble wrapping my head around it. It's more crucial than, than a lot of people realize. Okay. Think about it this way, right? Mm -hmm. A unit, they've got reliable comms. Okay. They've got fresh batteries for their night vision goggles. Mm -hmm. They've got a hot meal in their stomachs. Right. They're going to be way more resilient. Right. Right. Physically and mentally. They're not going to be as susceptible to fatigue to, to making those kind of... I don't know, foggy headed mistakes. Yeah. Or even even falling for for enemy disinformation, right? If they're thinking clearly. Right. They can focus on the mission. Uh. On maintaining good information discipline. Because think about it, a, a tired soldier, mm -hmm. a hungry soldier, yeah. they're more likely to let their guard down. To to share sensitive information, maybe without even realizing it. Oh, right. Yeah. Just by accident. Because they're not thinking straight. Exactly. And then on the flip side of that, a well-supplied force, that sends a message, right? Yeah, it does. Not just to our troops, but to the adversary, too. Right. Like, we're saying, we're here for the long haul. We're not going anywhere. We're ready. Yeah, we're ready to go. Hmm. Okay, what about protection? Okay. Now, obviously, there's there's the physical security aspect of it. Right. But in the information age, it's got to be bigger than that, that right? It takes on a whole new meaning. Yeah. yeah. So we've talked about cybersecurity. We've talked about OPSCC, but... I don't know. Are we talking about about protecting information itself, like as if it were a valuable resource, which of course it is. Think about it. Classified intel reports, operational plans, even just just something as basic as as troop movements. Right. If that information gets into the wrong hands, it can be incredibly damaging. Right. Even if it doesn't lead to like a direct attack or something. Right. The enemy, they gain an advantage. They understand our intentions better. They can anticipate our moves. Yeah, yeah. It's like giving them the answers to the test. And it goes beyond just, you know, preventing those kinds of leaks. We need to think about disinformation, right? Okay. Protecting our troops from enemy propaganda, psychological operations. So it's not just about, I don't know, building some digital firewall, right? It's, yeah. about, it's about making sure our soldiers, they are discerning, that they can look at a piece of information and, and tell if it's, I don't know, if it's legit or not. Every soldier needs to be a critical thinker. Mm. They need to question the information that they encounter. Not just blindly accepting everything, right? Right. And recognize how how information can be used against us. Wow. That's an important point. So we've covered these information activities. We've talked about how the war fighting functions come into play. But ADP 313, it also lays out these four principles, right, of information advantage. Mm -hmm. And the first one, offensively oriented, that one really jumps out at me. We can't just be passive in this environment. Absolutely not. We can't just sit back and wait for things to happen. Right. We have to be constantly looking for those opportunities to disrupt the enemy's decision-making process. Okay. While we're shaping the narrative in a way that, that supports what we're trying to accomplish. So it's not just about, you know, reacting to whatever the enemy throws at us. Yeah. It's about being proactive, keeping them on their toes. Think of it like a game of chess. We don't want to just respond to their moves. We want to be thinking several steps ahead. Yeah. Forcing them to react to us. So how do we do that? I mean, how do we actually shift from being reactive to proactive? Well, that's where the next principle comes in. 
combined arms. Okay. Information advantage. It's not just the responsibility of, you know, the intelligence folks or the cyber warriors. Right. It has to be a part of everything we do. Every single war fighting function. So the infantry squad on patrol, the artillery battery, even the folks driving the supply trucks. Everybody. They all have a role to play in this. Absolutely. Yeah. Let's say you've got an infantry squad, right? They're out on patrol. And they observe an enemy patrol moving through a village. Okay. They don't just report that up the chain and forget about it. Right. They understand that that observation, that report. Yeah. It's a piece of information. Mm -hmm. And when you take that piece and you combine it with other pieces, you start to get the bigger picture. It's like a jigsaw puzzle, right? Exactly. Every piece, even the little ones, they're all important. Mm -hmm. Every single one. And that leads us right into... Commander driven. Okay. Commanders, they need to understand this stuff. Right, because they're the ones calling the shots at the end of the day. They set the priorities, they're allocating resources, and they make sure that all of this that it's synchronized with with the overall plan. They're like the uh, the conductors of an orchestra. There you go. Making sure all the different instruments are, are wor working together in yeah. harmony. Exactly. <laughs> okay. And then we get to our final principle, soldier enabled. This is where the rubber meets the road, right? This is it. We can have the best technology in the world. Yeah. The best doctrine. Right. But none of it matters if our soldiers, if they're not equipped, if they don't know how to operate in this environment. So it all comes down to training, education, just being aware. It's about creating a culture where everyone understands how important this is, where every soldier understands their own personal responsibility to safeguard information, mm. to be able to identify and reject disinformation when they see it, yeah. and to use information Ethically and effectively. So if we want to boil it all down, it really starts with the individual soldier. Every single one. Wow. We have covered a lot of ground today. I mean, we've talked about everything from from these strategic contexts of information advantage all the way down to the principles that, that really guide how we execute it. Mm -hmm. But if there's one thing you walk away from this deep dive remembering, yeah. let it be this in modern warfare, information. It's not just a force multiplier. It's it's the decisive Definitely terrain. It's the battlefield. Yeah, it is the battlefield. And if you can master it, yeah. you can be in a great position to win. But yeah. if you ignore it, yeah. you risk being left behind. Left behind in the dust of the information age. And that is a very scary place to be. Yeah.